We know that there's, a, there's something wrong in their thinking because Paul talks about in verse 7, uh, or I'm sorry, in verse 6, he says, don't go beyond what is written because don't become puffed up one against another. another. See, what's happening is they're pitting Bible teachers against each other, and they're getting puffed up over what these people teach and the fact that they're associated with those people. Does that make sense? This is something that still goes on today, and maybe we can talk about that a little bit later. But in this case, he says, it's a small thing that I'd be judged by you. Not in pompousness, not in rage, not in as our society means, like I'll do whatever I want and you don't have a word to say to me. He's not saying that. He's saying because I'm a steward of God's things, because I endeavor to be faithful, which is required of me, it doesn't really matter what you think of me because I'm there to be faithful to what God has called me to do. And in this place, in this context, his commentary on his own life is, I don't, I'm not aware of anything in verse four that I'm not, not doing that I should do or that I am doing that I should not do. And, and we'll talk more about that because he says not even that really matters. So what's happening, and this happens all the time in, in pretty much any, I think any kind of uh, establishment where people want one thing to be like another. And this, it happens in a lot of different ways. So Paul, imagine Paul and Apollos, because they're kind of the two main examples he's using. We know from Acts that Apollos is what? He's an eloquent man, right? That's what he's called. Paulus is called an eloquent man in Acts. We know from 2 Corinthians that they call Paul, he's kind of wimpy. He's not impressive. He doesn't speak well which would be a pretty substantial issue because in, in Greek culture, oration is a heritage, or heralded and a very valued and exalted trait. So you have one man, Apollos, who possesses that trait, and you have another one, Paul, who evidently doesn't possess that trait. But you know what we don't have from Apollos? Any letters, do we? Not a one. But what do we have, for example, from Paul? We have the book of Romans, the letter to the Romans, which systematically, incredibly spells out in a genius form, inspired by the Holy Spirit, exactly how the gospel works. So you have one guy who's communicating, he's very eloquent. He has all the, and it's not a bad thing, he's able to communicate in ways that, that are they're fluid and are appreciated and, and that people can just get down with. Right? And then you have Paul, who evidently doesn't have that kind of speaking ability, or they're lying about him. But he has this gift from God to be able to communicate on paper and in ways that we don't have from any other author, do we? His sentence structure, all this incredible. So it's not uncommon for to come to a church or to, to have some interaction where someone says, I want you to be like that. Where they say, you're not this enough. You guys should be like that more. And you have church splits, whether there's drums or no drums in the worship, right? I went to a church that had drums. Your church doesn't have drums. I'm not going to your church anymore. If I was going to go to your church, then you know what? You'd need to have drums. I need you to be like this. So this, this is not like some sort of unbelievable scenario here. You know, and, and, and I'm not trying to complain or cry, but people will always have things. People, in fact, I remember years and years and years ago going to a teaching by a guy named Chuck Swindoll, the one time I ever heard him teach, I went to this conference, and I still remember his teaching was called Boars in the Garden. And basically what he talked about is the fact that when you labor, and it doesn't matter if you plan a church or you're a small group leader or the kitchen leader or the worship leader or whatever, anything you are, there will be people that will come. There will, there will be fruit. If there's fruit from your ministry, they will come to your ministry and they will say, you should actually do it like this. And when they don't do it like that, then they say, well, I'm leaving. To which you say, I'm sorry, goodbye. I mean, not to be flippant, but it's like, okay, that's cool. I'm, you know, if you can't, we can't be in agreement. I can see how we can't walk together. So what's happening in Corinth is just that. People are saying, Paul, you should be way more like Apollos. You should, they're pitting them against each other. You should be like Apollos. You should be way more eloquent. Why aren't you eloquent? Get with the program. Maybe they're saying to Apollos, why aren't you writing some letters? Why aren't you getting, getting some of this eloquent stuff down on paper? Why don't you, well, you should do what Paul does. But I'm with Paul because he just writes these incredible letters and he's, uh, yeah, okay, Apollos is eloquent, but come on, Paul, he's legit. Or maybe they like Peter, the giant Jew. 
right? All of our, all of our extra biblical texts we have about Peter is he's this big, burly, like he was tall, fisherman guy, big old fat beard. And maybe you just go, I can get down with that guy. He's a man's man. He fishes a lot. Or maybe you're one of the Jews that gets saved, and the fact that he seems to continue in Jewish um, culture and Jewish tradition. Remember, it's Peter that about 10 years after Jesus is, ascends into heaven, it's Peter that says to, to the vision, to God, no, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean. It's been 10 years. And then you have commentary in John where it says, that it says and thus Jesus made all foods clean. But Peter, 10 years later, is still upholding the dietary laws. Why is it that, that, that when men come from James, so where Peter's at at that specific time, which I'm not exactly sure, men come from James to that place to meet with Peter, and after these guys come from James in Jerusalem, Peter stops eating with uh, Gentiles. That's, that's really wild. Can you imagine? Here's this guy who's supposed to be an apostle. He rolled around with Jesus for three and a half years. He like knows what's up. You go to the potluck, and he's like, yeah, get away from me. I only eat with the Jews. I'm sure that wouldn't cause a problem, right? That's Peter. And then Paul says in Galatians, when he's writing to the Galatians, he said he got so far off that he even stumbled Barnabas. Barnabas is the dude that like starts the church in Antioch after it really, you know, it's, there's people get saved and the gathering starts. It's Barnabas that goes to Antioch, a basically purely Gentile church, and helps them. And, and so Peter has such an influence over Barnabas that Barnabas stops eating with Gentiles. And Paul says, I had to stand up and condemn him to the face in front of everybody. I mean, so if you're like a good old Jew, if you're like, man, remember the good old days when we had barbecues all the time with the priests? And oh, man, I love the Feast of Booze and camping with my kids. And oh, that was so great. Pete, Pete's my man because he's a good Jew that loves Jesus. All of a sudden, pity and all this crazy. And so their, their church is literally ripping apart because people are con they're, they're looking at these different teachers and they're elevating them and then they're associating their identity and their value with them and then they become proud over other people that don't have that same identity and value. Good thing that doesn't happen anymore. <laughs>